How did they end up where they are yeah. in control of so much territory? Yeah. Was that a complete surprise? Uh, I, I think uh, our head of uh, the intelligence community, uh, Jim Clapper, has acknowledged that I think they underestimated uh, what had been taking place in Syria. Well, so the president appears to blame the intelligence community for the rise of ISIS that could not have been foreseen. Now, a new report suggests the president actually missed half his briefings in person. Joining us right now uh, is Jen Psaki, spokesperson for the U.S. State Department. Jen, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. Great to be here. Uh, first off, on the, uh, on the statement on, on 60 Minutes on Sunday, the president pushing blame to James Clapper for not having the intelligence. But it seems as though there was intelligence out there. We even have Lieutenant General Michael Flynn coming across in February saying to a Senate in a Senate testimony, we believe, our, we believe that ISIL or Al-Qaeda in Iraq will look to take territory in Iraq and Syria to exhibit their strength in 2014. So it was out there. Was it just not listened to? Well, first of all, uh, Al-Qaeda and AQI, as they used to be called, they changed their name to ISIL about a year and a half ago. We've been tracking this group for some time. Everyone across the administration has been, the president, secretary of state, the intelligence community. But there's a difference between that, watching a terrorist organization, and knowing that uh, the Iraqi security forces would lay down their arms, uh, buckle, and not fight back. That's an incredibly right. hard thing to predict or track. And uh, what we've done over the past eight months, though, is increase our assistance to the Iraqi security forces. We've been providing them with Hellfire missiles. We've been providing them with more intelligence sharing, exactly because we've seen the threat mm -hmm. grow and the strength of ISIL grow over you're, the last You're months. definitely ramping up quickly. About the president missing uh, mo over 50 percent of his intelligence briefings, why would he choose to do that in a time that's so full, of, uh, in a time in, uh, in the world when it's so full of terrorist activity? Well, I have, I have no validation of those statistics. I have to say I worked for the president for six years. There's a range of ways that you can get your intelligence briefings on the road uh, in the White House, and I know that he receives those on a daily basis whenever he can. So you don't believe that the statistics are right that say he only was at 41 percent of the intelligence briefings? Well, Brian, I think the important thing here to note is that uh, this is, there's information the president receives on a daily basis. Uh, there's a range of officials in the administration, including the president, that make the decision to designate a terrorist organization, that made the decision to increase assistance to the Iraqi security forces, that made the decision to do strikes last week. Mm -hmm. uh, the president has been leading with the support of his national security team to take on this threat and take on this fight. And what we think we need to be focused on now is how we, what we do moving forward. Yeah, I, it just so it just uh, alarming because if you don't know what you did wrong, how do you move forward effectively? And if the intelligence community uh, community was getting it wrong, what has changed? So let's just well, talk. I think Go anyone ahead. in the let me just make one more point, if you don't mind. Anyone in the intelligence community will tell you who's worked in the intelligence community. It's very hard to predict, uh, nearly impossible to predict, that an, uh, an organization and a, a force like the Iraqi security forces were going to lay down their arms right. and not fight back. We well, knew this was a bad group. We knew it was a right. bad organization. We didn't know that uh, right. there wasn't going to be a fight back in Iraq. Right, Jen, that's a very good point. But if you were monitoring things after we left, you would see that all the, the Sunni leaders have been ousted, the Shia have been replaced. And with, a, with an embassy that large, with that many people, maybe we would been able to pick up what was going on there. But about the Iraqis laying down their arms, when Ramadi and Fallujah fell on January 3rd, Mosul on June 10th, Tikrit on June 11th, Talafar on June 15th, are we beginning to see a trend that it looks like it was all falling apart, but it took until September for us to take action? Well, I would disagree with that. We have been taking action and putting together a strategy over the last eight months. I think our strategy can't be do airstrikes and ask questions later. Uh, there's a range of steps we've taken. I mentioned the Hellfire missiles, increased support, increased uh, ISR, so intelligence sharing. We needed to have a strategy, know where our targets were, know we had a political backup in Iraq and a government that would be able to implement this moving forward. And that's what right. we've been working hard on over the last eight months. And that is probably one of the best news ever to get a new Iraqi government in there, although seeing Al Maliki as a vice president doesn't make people feel too uh, assured because he's still involved. But let's hope uh, uh, keep our fingers crossed that, that these guys are more inclusive and less Shia oriented. Now can we switch to a new group that America got familiar with over the last week and that's the Khorasan group. Now they seem to be a, get a special focus because you believe that they're a direct threat here. Can you tell us what types of plot they've already pulled off t to date? I can't go into those details for the safety and security, honestly, of the American people. But I can tell you we've been tracking the Corson group for about two years now. Uh, this is an affiliate 
uh, of Al-Qaeda. It's a group that we've been watching right. and we've had concerns about. That's why we took action. Right. Ali Soufan, who's one of our premier uh, Al-Qaeda experts and got the closest to anyone to stopping the 9-11 plot, said over the weekend that they are core Al-Qaeda. In fact, one of the people that led them there uh, was one of the few who knew about the 9-11 plot prior to the attack, and he said that the Khorasan is actually the, the region where Al-Qaeda lived, and they just switched to Syria because there was a gap to be filled. So if core Al-Qaeda still exists and is a direct threat to us, can we no longer say that we decimated core Al-Qaeda? Well, I think uh, what, the, what you're referring to, I believe, is the president's statements and uh, <clears throat> that we have decimated core al-Qaeda and, and uh, certainly killed Osama bin Laden. Those are all facts. This is the leadership of core al-Qaeda that was, has been our focus and was our focus early on uh, over the past couple of years. But what he said in his speech at West Point just a few months ago is that terrorism still remains one of the biggest threats to the American people. And we need to take on these threats where they face us, whether that's in Yemen, whether that's in Syria, other places. So certainly groups like the Khorasan Group, affiliates that we're seeing around the world, is part of the effort that's underway right now. But you don't believe it's core al-Qaeda. Well, I think, I think you're talking about okay. names and labels here. They are an affiliate. Certainly, they're a terrorist organization. That's why gotcha. we went after them, and we're, uh, we're trying to end their presence. Jen, it was so nice of you to get up and be with us this morning. Jen Saki, thanks to be so here. much. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Tim.